Good morning, everybody. Before the end of this month, and very possibly as early as tomorrow, the Prime Minister will trigger Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty, setting the United Kingdom on course to leave the EU in March 2019. It is important, therefore, for me to report now on the Scottish Government's attempts to find compromise with the UK Government and set out our plan to protect Scotland's interests. Right now, Scotland stands at a hugely important crossroads. We didn't choose to be in this position. In common with most people across the country, I wish that we weren't in this position. But we are, and the stakes are high. So we must have a plan for the way forward. For better or worse, depending on your point of view, the future of the UK looks very different today than it did two years ago. As a result of the Brexit vote, we face a future not just outside the EU, but also outside the world's biggest single market. In addition, the collapse of the Labour Party means that we face a prolonged period of uninterrupted and unchecked Conservative government at Westminster. Some predict that the Tories could be in power now at Westminster until 2030 or beyond. And after a period which has seen the establishment of the Scottish Parliament and more recently hard-won extensions to its responsibilities, we now face the prospect of a centralisation of power at Westminster. Indeed, the Prime Minister herself has been clear that the Brexit process will see the UK government reserve for itself powers in areas that are currently wholly devolved to the Scottish Parliament. All of this has massive implications for Scotland. It has implications for our economy, for jobs, opportunities, public spending and living standards, and for our ability to protect and advance our vital day-to-day -day priorities in education, health and business. It has implications for our society, how open, welcoming, diverse and fair will we be in future. And it has implications for our democracy. To what extent will we be able to determine our own direction of travel rather than having that decided for us? In short, it is not just a relationship with Europe that is at stake. What is at stake is the kind of country we will become. Now, at times of change and uncertainty, the instinct to do nothing and just hope for the best is understandable. But in my view, it is not the right one. At times like these, it is more important than ever to have a clear plan for the way ahead, to try as far as is possible to be in control of events and not just at the mercy of them. That is what I have always done. It is what I have tried to do since the day after the EU referendum last year. And it is what I am determined to continue to do. Since last June, my focus has been on trying to find an agreement with the UK government, an agreement that would reconcile the UK wide vote to leave the European Union with the Scottish vote to remain. I was encouraged in this approach by the Prime Minister's commitment last July to seek agreement with the devolved administrations on a UK-wide approach before triggering Article 50. The Scottish Government's paper, Scotland's Place in Europe, was published in good faith. Our proposals represent significant compromise on the part of the Scottish Government. We accepted that Scotland would leave the EU despite the 62% vote to remain, but we argued that the UK should either stay in the single market or seek an outcome that would allow Scotland to do so. And we set out how greater powers for the Scottish Parliament could help protect Scotland's interests in a post-Brexit landscape. Over the past few months, we have worked hard, really hard, to try to find agreement. The Prime Minister and her government have been given every opportunity to compromise. But today, as we stand, for all we know, on the eve of Article 50 being triggered, not only is there no UK-wide agreement on the way ahead,
But the UK government has not moved even an inch in pursuit of compromise and agreement. Our efforts at compromise have instead been met with a brick wall of intransigence. UK membership of the single market was ruled out with no prior consultation with the Scottish Government or indeed with the other devolved administrations, leaving us facing not just Brexit, but a hard Brexit. There has been talk of special deals for the car industry and others, but a point-blank refusal to discuss in any meaningful way a differential approach for Scotland. And far from any prospect of significant new powers for the Scottish Parliament, the UK Government is becoming ever more assertive in its intention to muscle in on the powers we already have. The language of partnership has gone completely. And there should, I think, be little doubt about this. If Scotland can be ignored on an issue as important as our membership of the EU and the single market, then it is clear that our voice and our interests can be ignored at any time and on any issue. That cannot be a secure basis on which to build a better Scotland. But it is where we stand today. Now let me stress, even at this late stage, I am not turning my back on further discussions should the UK government change its mind and decide that it is willing to agree to our compromise proposals. And in any event, I will do everything I possibly can to ensure that Scotland's interests are represented in the EU negotiations that lie ahead. But I cannot pretend to the Scottish people that a compromise agreement looks remotely likely, given the hardline response from the Prime Minister so far. That means I have to decide on the best plan to protect our interests now. It is time for me to set out decisively and with clarity the way forward. Doing nothing at this stage, in many ways the easiest thing for me to do, would mean letting Scotland drift through the next two years with our fingers crossed, simply hoping for the best. And of course, I do hope for the best. I want the UK to get a good deal from the EU negotiations. That is clearly in Scotland's interests as well as in the interests of our friends in other parts of the UK. But I am far from alone in fearing a bad deal or indeed no deal. Nor am I alone in fearing that even a so-called good deal will be significantly inferior to membership of the single market and that it will set Scotland on a course that will not only damage our economy but change the very nature of the society and country that we are. The problem with doing nothing now is that by the time these fears are realised, it will be too late for Scotland to choose a different path before the damage is done. That would not be right or fair. Whatever path we take, it should be one decided by us, not for us. So let me set out the plan I intend to pursue. First, I will continue to stand up for Scotland's interests during the process of Brexit negotiations. Second, I will now take the steps necessary to make sure that Scotland will have a choice at the end of this process. A choice of whether to follow the UK to a hard Brexit or to become an independent country, able to secure a real partnership of equals with the rest of the UK and our own relationship with Europe. The Scottish Government's mandate for offering this choice is beyond doubt. Last year, we were elected with the highest share of the constituency vote won by any party in the history of devolution on a manifesto that said this. The Scottish Parliament should have the right to hold another referendum if there is a significant and material change in the circumstances that prevailed in 2014, such as Scotland being taken out of the EU against our will. These conditions have, of course, now been met. So I can confirm today that next week I will seek the authority of the Scottish Parliament to agree with the UK Government the details of a Section 30 order, the procedure that will enable the Scottish Parliament to legislate for an independence referendum. The UK Government was clear in 2014 that an independence referendum should, in their words, be made in Scotland by the people of Scotland. That is a principle that should be respected today. 
The detailed arrangements for a referendum, including its timing, must be for the Scottish Parliament to decide. However, in my view, it is important that Scotland is able to exercise the right to choose our own future at a time when the options are clearer than they are now, but before it is too late to decide our own path. Let me be clear what I mean by that. The timing of the Brexit negotiations are not, of course, within the control of the Scottish Government. However, we must plan on the basis of what we do know now. And what we know is that on the timetable set out by the Prime Minister, the shape of the Brexit deal will become clear in the autumn of next year, ahead of ratification votes by other EU countries. That is therefore the earliest point at which a referendum would be appropriate. However, it is just as important that we do not leave it too late to choose a different path in a timely way. If the UK leaves the EU without Scotland indicating beforehand, or at least within a short time after it, that we want a different relationship with Europe, we could face a lengthy period outside not just the EU, but also the single market. And that would make the task of negotiating a different future much more difficult. These considerations lead me to the conclusion that if Scotland is to have a real choice, when the terms of Brexit are known, but before it is too late to choose our own course, then that choice must be offered between the autumn of next year, 2018, and the spring of 2019. The third important aspect of planning ahead is this. I have already said that by the time a choice comes to be made, there must be greater clarity about Brexit and its implications for us. It is just as important that there is clarity about the implications of independence, and there will be. We will be frank about the challenges we face and clear about the opportunities independence will give us to secure a relationship with Europe, build a stronger and more sustainable economy and create a fairer society. Scotland's choice must be informed and up to date. There is a great deal of talk by all of us about mandates from the referendums in 2014 and 2016. And of course, neither of these results can or should be dismissed. But the fact is, they tell us only so much about the circumstances we find ourselves in now. In 2014, we didn't know that the UK would vote to leave the EU. Had we done so, it is likely that some, perhaps on both sides, would have come to a different decision. And in 2016, independence was not on the ballot paper. We cannot simply assume that because someone voted to remain in the EU, that they would vote yes for an independent Scotland. What Scotland deserves, in the light of the material change of circumstances brought about by the Brexit vote, is the chance to decide our future in a fair, free and democratic way, and at a time when we are equipped with the facts that we need it is, above all, about informed choice. We know that Brexit has made change inevitable. The option of no change is no longer available. However, we can still decide the nature of that change. Having Scotland's referendum at a time when the terms of Brexit are known will give the Scottish people a choice about the kind of change we want. And it must be a choice for all of us. I know that there are some who want me to rule out a referendum completely or delay the decision until much, much further down the line. I understand why some take that view. And of course, these views do weigh heavily on me. But so does this. And this for me is a key consideration. If I ruled out a referendum, I would be deciding, completely unilaterally, that Scotland will follow the UK to a hard Brexit come what may, no matter how damaging to our economy and our society it turns out to be. That should not be the decision of just one politician, not even the First Minister. By taking the steps I have set out today, I am ensuring that Scotland's future will be decided not just by me, the Scottish Government or the SNP, it will be decided by the people of Scotland. 
It will be Scotland's choice, and I trust the people to make that choice. I am now happy to take a few questions. Brian. I can ask a question with two clauses, I know that's slightly cheeky, but uh, uh, first of all, I can ask a question with, with two clauses, Brian Taylor, BBC Scotland. Are you assuming, from what you say, that Scotland would simply take over the, the membership of, of the European Union that presently exists for the, for the UK? Are you assuming that that is possible? As many say, it's not. If that is not the case, are you saying that you would absolutely, definitely, and without caveat, seek to return Scotland to full membership of the European Union, not just the single market? Okay. Um, what I'm saying uh, today very clearly is that for Scotland uh, to be in a position to negotiate in a timely fashion our own relationship with Europe, it is important that we indicate that desire and intention before the UK leaves, uh, or at the very least within a short time frame after they do so. To leave it any longer than that would make that process more difficult. I do accept that that will be a process uh, of discussion. In terms of uh, the second uh, clause of your, your question, the SNP's long-standing uh, policy and commitment has been to membership of the European Union. Um, obviously, we are in different circumstances now than we have been in the past, uh, but that has been uh, and remains our position. But on this issue, as on all of the many other issues uh, that will, people will want uh, to consider in advance of a choice, I've said very clearly that we will set out our proposition um, in advance of that choice so that it is an informed choice. I, I want people, uh, and for me this is all about choice, it's about people looking at what the terms of Brexit will mean for Scotland and what the alternative of independence will mean and having the ability to make that choice. Because the alternative to that is not being in control of our own future, of having uh, hard Brexit imposed upon us regardless of the circumstances that that would place us into and I don't think that is acceptable. Colin. Uh, have you just been playing along with the talk of negotiations to get to what was, from the outset, your favourite position of an independence referendum? Uh, absolutely and emphatically not. Uh, to, to the frustration, no doubt, of some people in my own party uh, at times over the past few months, I have been genuine and sincere about trying to reach a compromise agreement with the UK government. I stood at this very podium in this very room on the 24th of June last year and said that that would be uh, my intention and I've worked over the intervening months to try to bring that about. Uh, we have published Scotland's Place in Europe, genuine compromise proposals. I have sat in uh, meetings, I've sat uh, in a room with the Prime Minister, just the two of us looked her in the eye and told her I was uh, willing to find agreement and compromise. Uh, but we have not met uh, with a government uh, and a Prime Minister who appear willing to meet us halfway in that. Um, indeed, on the contrary, at times over the past few weeks, it feels as if uh, they have been moving further away from compromise with language that has appeared to become harder uh, and harder. You know, I, this perhaps is a minor point. It is a minor point in many ways, but it tells a bigger story. Uh, I'm standing here as the First Minister of Scotland, uh, and I don't know whether Article 50 is going to be triggered tomorrow or Wednesday or next week or the week after that. And that tells its own story about how far away from an equal partnership this process uh, has been. You know, the morning of our Lancaster House speech, when I spoke to the Prime Minister on the telephone, I asked her the direct question is, are you going to rule out single market membership? Uh, and she said that wasn't a binary choice. Uh, two hours later, it had become a binary choice and it had been ruled out. So we have been trying to compromise. Uh, but in order to compromise, there requires to be uh, a government on the other side willing to meet halfway, and that's not uh, been the case. Uh, so that leads me to the position I've set out today. If Scotland is to have a genuine choice, uh, then it must be in the way that I have set out. Right, uh, Sarah. You'll be very well aware that opinion polls still don't suggest more than 50 of the country would want to vote for independence. The economic circumstances are much harder for you than they were in 2014. Do you really believe you could win another referendum on independence? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, absolutely, I believe that. Uh, but sometimes you've got to do what you think is right uh, in politics. And I think it's right for Scotland to have a choice. 
Um, I believe that it would be wrong for Scotland to be taken down a path that it has no control over, regardless of the consequences for our economy, uh, for our society, for our place in the world, for our very sense of who we are as a country. Uh, that would be wrong. And therefore, uh, my judgment is that we should have that choice. Now, I believe uh, that uh, in a referendum, uh, the Scottish people will opt for independence, uh, but that will be the choice of the Scottish people, and I've been very clear that that must be an informed choice, with the implications of Brexit much clearer than they are today, but also uh, the implications and opportunities of independence clear. And you, you mentioned the economy, and, and the reality today is that the economics of staying with the UK in a post-Brexit landscape uh, are you know, significantly uh, more challenging than would have been the case previously. So in a, a circumstance uh, that we face now, the, the choice is not can we uh, magic away change or magic away challenge. Uh, the question for Scotland is what puts us in the best possible position uh, to steer our way to a stronger and more sustainable economy uh, and a fairer society. I think that will be uh, by choosing to be an independent country, but that will be the choice of the Scottish people. Uh, Peter. First Minister, you've said that uh, you want Scotland, an independent Scotland, to be part of the single market with freedom of movement. You've just said that the Prime Minister doesn't, in your view, want to have that. Therefore, is it not inevitable under your proposals that there will be a border north of Carlisle or north of Berwick? And I know you say there isn't going to be one in Ireland, but all the talk in Ireland is Peter, it's it's customary not for the journalist to both ask and answer uh, the question. Uh, just to, to to be clear, the, the usual form at these events is that you ask and I get to answer. But but if you want to to answer all my questions for me, that is absolutely fine. Um, look, we will set out all of these. Uh, propositions and options for people in the fullness of time. Based on what I've announced today, we have a legislative process to go through. Uh, but let's be clear about a number of things. There is across these islands a common travel area. There is absolutely no reason why that would or should change if Scotland became an independent country. Uh, we do have a situation, uh, and this uh, is the, the partial answer you gave me, uh, whereby the UK government, in the form of both the Prime Minister and the Secretary of State for exiting the EU, have said in terms that Brexit does not mean the inevitability of a hard border between the Republic of Ireland and the rest of the UK. If that is true, in the Irish context and I absolutely uh, appreciate and I'm acutely aware of the different history of Ireland and I think it is absolutely right and essential that uh, arrangements are found to avoid that in Ireland but practically if that is the case then there is no reason at all to suggest that it would be different in Scotland. Uh, and lastly and you know just ask people to reflect on the contradictions at the heart of much of what the UK government is saying right now. This is a government that is claiming that it's going to be freely trading with every country in the world somehow with the exception of an independent Scotland. It doesn't bear scrutiny. Uh, I want this choice in the fullness of time to be one that is informed. Uh, both sides uh, will have to put forward their case and be subject to a uh, proper and robust challenge. Let me be very clear. It's been put to me that uh, I would look at the example of the EU referendum and try to somehow have a fact-free uh, referendum in Scotland. I would not want uh, Scotland's future to be decided in the way that the EU referendum was decided. Uh, this is a, a choice in which people should have the facts and the information in order to make an informed choice. Uh, but we could all probably start... Uh, the way we mean to go on uh, by not uh, getting straight back into the kind of Project Fear uh, campaign that we saw in 2014. Let's make it a positive debate about Scotland's future. Uh, I'll take uh, David and then Julie. Mm -hmm. uh, David Clegg from the Daily Record. Uh, First Minister, are you staking your First Ministership on this? Um, if you were to lose this referendum, would you resign? Uh, I'm doing what I think is right for the country. Um, and. Uh, I, I'm not planning uh, not to win uh, a referendum when that time comes. Julie. Julie Etch from ITV News. Uh, First Minister, what reassurance have you had from other EU members that Scotland's way forward, either remaining within the European Union or re-entering the European Union, is in any way viable? What concrete reassurance have you had? Look, we have, uh, over the past nine months, been working 
uh, very hard to influence the UK government's negotiating position. And, and that has been partly as a result of some of the advice and feedback we've had from other countries across Europe, that if we wanted to seek a differential arrangement for Scotland, then Europe would be open to that, but it had to come through the track of the UK Article 50 negotiations. So that has been uh, our focus. Uh, clearly, we will continue to discuss uh, with the uh, other countries of the European Union and indeed with the institutions of the European Union. Uh, I know from uh, my own experience across Europe that there is an incredible uh, warmth of feeling towards Scotland and incredible support and a feeling uh, that should Scotland democratically choose to be an independent country, then that is something uh, that the EU would uh, accept and respect. And uh, these discussions will con continue no doubt in the months to come. Right, I have a, a sea of, of hands. Uh, let me, uh, the choice, the choice, I'll take uh, Michael. Is there anything that uh, the UK government could now say which would persuade you to rule out having a referendum? Well, they'd have to come forward and say something because I'm standing here after several months of trying to uh, find and broker agreement without having had a, an inch of movement, as I, I said. So, uh, you know, it's not really for me now to, to say uh, what they could have said. I, I don't know uh, that there is any prospect of them trying to say anything, because if there is now, then why haven't we had it uh, in the past? But I've said, you know, of course, I, uh, I my door will always be open to discussion, notwithstanding uh, the, the track that I have uh, laid out today. There will continue to be a need for me as First Minister to ensure that Scotland's interests are represented in the negotiations that will follow uh, from the triggering of Article 50. So I am open to discussions, but the, the, the conduct and the response of the UK government thus far tells me they are not interested in or willing to compromise. And that is why I uh, find myself in the position that I'm in today, potentially just one day before Article 50 might be triggered. Uh, right, I'll take Severin, uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll choose the next one after that. Seb. First Minister, when you launched the SNP manifesto in April last year, you said quite clearly that, quote, setting the date for a referendum before a majority of the Scottish people have been persuaded that independence is the best future for our country is the wrong way around. Why was that correct then, but wrong now? Well, that's not actually the case, Severin, because if you read the text of our manifesto, what it says, and uh, I don't have it in front of me, but I'm sure you will go and uh, check uh, that I'm correct in what I'm about to say. It said that uh, the, the Scottish Parliament would have the right uh, to hold another referendum uh, should there be evidence of a, a change in public opinion or, the key word being or, a material change in circumstances such as Scotland being taken out of the EU against our will. That is what... Quoting what you said in well, response to question, I, I am quoting the manifesto that we put before the Scottish people and were elected on with, as I said earlier on, the biggest share of the constituency vote of any party in the history of devolution. Uh, that is the manifesto that we were elected on. It is unequivocal, unambiguous, and it provides the mandate for the steps that I've set out today. Uh, Peter. You said you want to have a referendum between autumn 2018 and spring, spring of 2019. Theresa May has said that Scotland is leaving the EU with the UK. If Theresa May says to you that, OK, I'm not going to block your referendum, but you have to wait until after Brexit, what recourse do you have? Well, I do not think it would be acceptable for the UK government or the Prime Minister to take that view for, for two reasons. One principle and one practical. In principle, we set the precedent in 2014 uh, for, as I, I said, the, I quoted the words that the UK government used back then, that the details of a, an independence referendum should be for the people of Scotland to decide and these should be decided in Scotland. That is the principled argument. It should be for the Scottish Parliament, not incidentally the Scottish Government, but the Scottish Parliament. I have set out very clearly today that in order to do what I have set out I want now to do, I need the authority of the Scottish Parliament and I will seek that next week. If the Scottish Parliament gives me that authority, uh, then I believe that uh, should uh, be respected by the UK government. Uh, the practical reason is this. As I've set out, yeah, I think it's really important that before people in Scotland uh, are asked to make this choice, they have clarity about Brexit and what Brexit means. I, I accept that. But equally, I believe that if we are to have a genuine choice with the ability to choose a different course, then we can't leave that choice until it is too late for that to happen. That's why I've set out the window in the way that I have today. And for the UK government to say that they are not going to uh, permit that to happen in that window, broadly speaking, uh, would be 
compromising the ability of the Scottish government, if the people in Scotland opted for this, uh, to choose a, a different future and to negotiate a different relationship with Europe. And it would be, I guess, tantamount to the UK government having sunk the ship uh, with the Brexit vote, trying to puncture Scotland's lifeboat uh, as well. And I simply don't think that would be an acceptable position for them to take. Uh, right, uh, Tom. Um, First Minister, when would you have to make a decision on whether to hold a referendum? Because obviously there's a sort of set process in advance of the country choosing, maybe four or six months in advance of that. When would you have to make a decision? In terms of setting a date? Yes, because of all that. Sure. We, we, we have, firstly, we have to go through the Section 30 process and, you know, I can't stand here uh, right now and say categorically how long that will take because that is a discussion between the Scottish Government and the UK Government. I would certainly hope that that wouldn't be a lengthy process. Uh, and then the Scottish Government requires to legislate. Um, and then, of course, we have uh, well accepted uh, rules in terms of timings for campaigns and such like. Uh, so, you know, in a, in, in a sense, the, the, the final decisions around uh, the, the, the timing, the date would be for uh, the Scottish Parliament to set out. And that would be taken sometime uh, later this year or perhaps into the early part uh, of next year. Uh, right, Simon. Um, is there a contradiction between your argument that um, leaving the European Union would be a disaster for the economy, for the country, country that we are, and the solution being leaving a union that's far more valuable to Scotland's economy with far closer cultural and family ties? Uh, no, I, I don't think there is for uh, a number of reasons. Firstly, uh, I am not... Uh, positing a choice that says choose trading in the single market instead of trading across the UK. I'm arguing that we should continue to trade within the single market in addition to free trade across the UK. And of course, the single market is something like eight times bigger uh, than the market across the UK. Uh, secondly, and this was uh, you know, a, a, an issue uh, discussed and debated uh, long and hard during uh, the 2014 uh, discussions, Scotland becoming politically independent is not turning our backs on the social and, and cultural and family ties that exist between uh, the different parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, we, are, uh, we share many links with our friends in other parts of the British Isles and that would continue to be the case. Uh, but independence for Scotland would, I think, create a genuine partnership of equals rather than the claimed partnership of equals that has been shown in recent months uh, to be uh, rhetoric rather than reality. Um, but the bigger question, I guess, is, is this one. Of course, we are where we are today because of the Brexit vote, and therefore issues around EU membership uh, are, uh, of course, central to the discussions uh, that are taking place around this. But I, I think there is a much, much bigger principle at stake here, and that is what kind of country do we want to be? And crucially, who gets to decide that? Uh, right now, we're on a path, not just to Brexit, but to hard Brexit, that will have profound implications for our economy, our society, our, our culture, place in the world, sense of who we are. Um, and we have no control over that. Uh, we voted against it, but nevertheless, that is the direction the UK government is intent and taking us in. Uh, I don't think it is right uh, to be taken down a path that we don't want to go down uh, without a choice, which is why the choice, I think, is important. At the right time, the people of Scotland should get to choose. Do they want to follow the rest of the UK to a hard Brexit? If, in which case, that is for the people of Scotland to choose. Or do we want to choose an independent future that gives us the ability to create a real partnership of equals across the UK and to decide our own relationship with Europe? Right, take a few more questions, Muir. Will you be expecting the Scottish Parliament uh, government to decide the franchise for this next referendum and the question? And yes. you said you clearly don't think it's acceptable for the UK government to um, deny the Scottish Parliament demands on this, but if it does, what can you do about it? But I'm not expecting it to. And, you know, I, I, I'm not therefore going to speculate on what will happen if, if it does. Um, I, I think there would be a rather furious reaction from many people in Scotland, not just the Scottish Government, if that was the position the UK Government decided to take. Uh, both Ruth Davidson and David Mundell, since the Brexit vote, have said in terms that they didn't think Westminster should block 
a second referendum. And uh, even the Prime Minister, I think, when she's been pressed on this, uh, my reading of her answers have been that she's been at pains not to say that the UK government uh, would do that. And of course, we had Jeremy Corbyn on Saturday saying that he thought it was absolutely fine uh, for uh, there to be an independence referendum. Uh, per perhaps that last bit is less important in the grand uh, scheme of things. Uh, on the first part of your question, yes, I do think it would be for the Scottish Parliament to decide not just the timing but the franchise uh, and the question, although of course the question would be subject to testing uh, by the Electoral Commission if it chose uh, to do that. Uh, but these things were accepted uh, in 2014, that these were the decisions not of the Scottish Government but of the Scottish Parliament and I would see no reason why that should be different in future. Uh, on the, you, you've tried so hard, Jess, and we didn't give you a seat, so I better take a question. Well, all in good time. We will set out, as I've said, our uh, proposition on all of the issues that people in Scotland will require to have clarity about. And we will do that uh, in due course. And, uh, you know, I've said uh, repeatedly today that I absolutely recognise this has to be an informed choice for people, uh, informed both by the clarity around Brexit and the clarity around independence. Uh, I, I'm not asking people to choose the UK or Europe. I want Scotland, whether as we are just now or as an independent country, uh, to have as our closest relationships, those we have with uh, our friends and partners in other parts of uh, the, the UK and the British Isles. Uh, but I also believe Scotland has uh, a part to play, not just in economic terms, but in social and cultural terms uh, in Europe as well. And fundamentally, this is about Scotland, I think, deciding uh, what kind of country we want to be and what we want that contribution, not just in the UK, but across Europe uh, to be. So I, I don't accept the characterisation of asking people to choose the UK or Europe. It's about Scotland choosing itself choose what, kind, what kind of country uh, we will be. Uh, yes, Jamie. But we will put forward, as I said, uh, the, the detail and the clarity on a range of issues that people uh, want, uh, will want to have clarity on before any choice is made. We will uh, announce in due course what the form and timing of that will be. Uh, John. First Minister, um, some of your own party have admitted that they were less than frank, or the movement was less than frank last time about some of the challenges facing an independent Scotland. You said this morning that you're quite happy to engage in that going forward, that you want to be frank about it. What are those challenges? I think Scotland, uh, whatever our constitutional uh, circumstances, like every other country, uh, faces challenges in the world we live in. Economic challenges, challenges uh, around some of the global uh, global situations we face right now. And we need to be frank uh, about those, as we need to be frank about uh, how we would deal with those challenges if we were to remain within the, the UK. And, uh, you know, I, I said earlier on, I, if Scotland is to have a choice about its future, it must be an informed choice. Um, for my part, I will make sure uh, that that is the case uh, and you know, people then uh, get to decide what they think is the best uh, way for Scotland to uh, address those challenges in the future. Right, another last couple of questions. Jess Keane. Um, on a practical level, have you had any discussions with the Greens so far to make sure you can actually get the Scottish Parliament to approve requests for a section 30 order? Uh, well, we discussed with the Greens issues on a, a range of matters on a, an ongoing basis. I'll let the Greens uh, speak for them, themselves today, but I think the Greens' position on uh, independence and uh, an independence referendum is, is pretty clear, but I will not uh, presume to speak for them uh, from this podium. Uh, Michael. Um, you said you'd remain engaged with the Brexit process. Will the Scottish Government consider legislation within devolved competence to protect the existing rights of EU citizens in Scotland, namely the vote? access healthcare and to the new social security agency? Uh, we will do everything we possibly can, uh, legislatively, practically, uh, and uh, you know, in, in every other sense, to protect the rights uh, and status of EU nationals in Scotland. Uh, one of the uh, many regrettable things that have happened, I think, since the EU referendum has been a failure to give that uh, guarantee uh, to EU nationals. Um, and I will do uh, now and in the future everything within my power to give that certainty and those guarantees. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, first Minister, now that you've 
made your position clear. Can we expect the Scottish Government to spend the next 18 months working to try and get support within Europe from the other 27 member states for Scottish membership? Uh, we will work uh, across a range of uh, different issues and a range of different ways to protect Scotland's interests. That's what all this is about, protecting Scotland's interests in a circumstance that we didn't ask to be in. Um, it's also about making sure that going forward uh, we have the right environment, the right uh, set of circumstances in Scotland to allow us to continue to advance our priorities on health, on education, on the economy, uh, making sure that we are properly equipped as a country to face up to whatever challenges uh, lie ahead. Right, last uh, couple of questions, Jennifer. Um, how do you reconcile uh, the, the push for independence with people who, who are SNP supporters but want to come out of the EU? Well, this is fundamentally about who decides what kind of country we are. I, I respect the views of, of people across Scotland, whether they're SNP supporters or, or otherwise, who took a different view uh, from the one I did on the question of EU membership. Um, a million people in Scotland voted to leave, and as First Minister, I've got a duty to understand and respond to that. So I, I respect those views. Uh, and clearly, we are where we are because of that vote. But as I've said on more than one occasion today, uh, there is a bigger issue at stake here, and it is an issue of democratic principle. Who decides uh, Scotland's future, whether on Europe or on any other issue? And I believe uh, that on that issue of democratic principle, uh, whether uh, an SNP supporter voted to remain or voted to leave, uh, there will be strong support for Scotland exercising our choice to be in control of our own future. Uh, right. Yes. Chris Green, the eye. Uh, do you think it will be a yes-no question? I would see no reason why it wasn't the same question as, as the last time, but I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. We have a process to go through. Uh, Glenn? Where does this leave your defining mission of reform and education? That is still my defining mission of this Parliament as First Minister. You know, people say to me, you know, get on with education and health, and that's my day-to-day -day work, and it will always be my day-to-day -day work. But this cannot be separated from that day-to-day -day job uh, to protect Scotland's interests and to advance uh, Scotland's interests across a range of issues. If, if we're taking off a, a hard Brexit cliff edge with implications for our economy and public spending and living standards, that impacts on our ability uh, to fulfil our ambitions on these uh, issues. So this is integral to, to use the colloquial phrase, the day job that I do, protecting Scotland's interests and making sure that Scotland is in the best possible position to make continued advances in education, health or any other uh, issue. Right, I will take one uh, final question. Uh, Tom, you've had one already. Uh, I'll, I'll be fair and go to the gentleman behind you. You've outlined a journey of up to two years to an independence referendum. Do you accept that any referendum can cause uncertainty which can damage the economy and how will you well, we work, uh, as we do every day, with uh, the business community here in Scotland and those who uh, have a desire to invest in Scotland. But the, the fundamental point I made is, is this one. Uh, Brexit has made change inevitable. You know, we cannot now get to a position where uh, there is no change. Brexit has created and made inevitable uh, a degree of uncertainty. The choice that I believe Scotland should have is therefore what kind of change do we want? It's about bringing greater clarity and greater certainty and greater control over the process that lies ahead of us. Thank you all very much indeed.